Secret Societies, The Search for the Holy Grail, The White Powder of Gold, Solomon's Treasure. What a night this is going to be. I feel like uh, Nicolas Cage, National Treasures. No, up next, Sir Lawrence Gardner on Coast to Coast AM. Sir Lawrence Gardner, constitutional historian, genealogist, broadcaster. He's a presidential attaché to the European Council of Princes in Scotland. He's the prior of the sacred kindred of St. Columbia and a Knight Templar of St. Anthony. His writing career has included collaborative projects with national institutions such as the British Tourist Authority, the Government of Ontario, the Russian Ministry of Culture, Dr. Lawrence Gardner is a top 10 nationally acclaimed author internationally as well with published works in many languages. Lawrence Gardner back on Coast to Coast. Hey, Lawrence, how are you? Hello there, George. Good to be back. Always and a I'm pleasure. Well. Thanks, and you? I call you Sir, Sir Lawrence, or have I knighted you? <laughs> no, no, Lawrence is fine. <laughs> I love it. How have you been? I've been good at been a while since i've been on isn't it a couple of years i think or uh near, yes. near enough it's coming up to two, it, actually it's coming up on three years is it too long my god you were on a uh, may, well, may of 2005 with me time flies it sure does of course i met you at a conference uh, with bill henry a year and a half ago maybe remember that one yeah i was over in la wasn't i yes, was, you yes were. that's correct yeah Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, lots to talk with you about today. Your latest work, The Shadow of Solomon. Um, let's go back a little bit, though. Let's talk about the uh, the Grail bloodline, because it has a lot to do with some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. You know, uh, it, it's been years now with this Da Vinci Code and the furor over that. Has that died down at all? Well, interestingly, no. Um, I mean, it was 2003 when the book came out, and... Then the fever began, and then it was 2006, we had the movie, and that boosted it all again. And on a worldwide basis, it became one of the biggest things ever. I mean, it was the biggest selling hardback book of all time, for whatever reason. Um, And I had an idea at that time that what would happen was that it would probably sort of kill off the real interest, because it had become novelized it had become fantastic in many ways and i i just figured it would die down but what actually happened was quite the opposite um it stirred an interest but it wasn't just an interest in the entertainment factor it was a real interest in the subject and lots and lots of people started to email me and call me via people that i knew to to ask questions and uh, a lot had had actually noted and, and noticed discrepancies in Dan Brown's story as against what had been published over the years on the subject, and they wanted to know where where the fact was and where the fiction was, where the two met, where they differed. Mm -hmm. And um, so I became sort of overwhelmed, particularly after the film. And um, it seemed to ignite a a fuse of extra interest. And in fact, the the readership potential just broadened considerably in the non-fiction market. And that led my publisher and I to sort of get our heads together. And they said, well, look, you know, what, why not try and answer some of these questions that you haven't answered in your previous book? How, how about having another go at it? Because it's 12 years since Bloodline of the Holy Grail came out. I, I, that was published for me in 1996. So I thought, OK. And I went back to base and... Um, what I knew was that when Bloodline was first published, there was a heck of a lot of information that I had that, I, that right. never got into the book anyway. I mean, the book was was really um, sort of constrained. It, it covered such an enormous span of time, you know, 2,000 years of history in Bloodline of Holy Grail. So I thought, well, what, I, what I'll do, I'll, I'll write a completely new book, and I'll just tie it to the first few hundred years. I, I, I won't go back beyond the Jesus gospel period the other way, and I won't come really much beyond about the year 600 AD the other way. And I'll just put into it everything that I've got about that 600 years. And um, that, as against 2,000 years in the other book, uh, ended up being a book of exactly the same size. (laughs) Uh, So that comes out now on March the 3rd. It's entitled The Grail Enigma. And uh, so uh, just a couple of weeks now, and we're for release. Oh my gosh, we're just talking about one here that I that I just got done reading, The Shadow of uh, Solomon. 
Yes, they come thick and fast. They, yeah, they uh, do. You're quite pro- prolific yeah. when it comes to that. Yeah, actually, Solomon's been out for a while. It just took a little while to get into America. Right. You know, sometimes that happens. I, I never quite know what the, the time gap is going to be between the UK release at this end and the American release. It depends on, on what deal the publishers do, you know. Uh, and so with the Grail Enigma, I'm not sure when that'll be in the States. Actually, it's coming out in the UK um, in two weeks' time, but the, the, the United States version will follow. Let's go back, go back, Lawrence, if we can, to the period of King Solomon. Uh, and we've heard so much about King Solomon's treasure uh, in the first movie, National Treasure, with Nicolas Cage. We saw, uh, of course, the fictional Solomon's treasure uh, hidden away. Uh, let's go back to that era, if we can, and if you would just tell us a little bit about this king, what happened to him, what happened to the treasure? Yes, well, um, forgetting Nicolas Cage, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and who knows, there, there still might be some treasure out there for Nicolas Cage to find. Uh, you know, one doesn't know that. I, I mean, the importance of King Solomon seems to be that, that in, in biblical terms, you know, once the uh, kingship of Judah and, and Israel had begun under King David, and we're, we're looking at about a thousand BC at that, that sort of period, um, that, that, that Solomon seems to be one of the most written about. Uh, and remember, all, all of the writings about the kings were done in retrospect and in hindsight. You know, some long time mm-hmm, afterwards, mm-hmm. a few hundred years afterwards, but they sort of settled on King Solomon as being something really, really special. And um, uh, uh, and we we really only only got the Bible to go on here. There's, there's not a lot about King Solomon outside the Bible which doesn't use it as a base for its information. So, you know, we, we don't know what the ultimate truths and strengths of it all are. Uh, but he became famed in the first place because he um, built the first, Temple of Jerusalem, and I, I, I suppose that that was the sort of main claim to fame. But but what did seem to happen was that from from being the, the son of a king who was uh, a warlord, I suppose David was a, a military leader. Uh, uh, essentially, Solomon seemed to establish a, a basis for what became known as kingship. And um, so he wasn't a great warrior, it didn't seem. He, he became a judicial type of king, but, but he was enormously wealthy. Enormously. I mean, when one reads through uh, what is said about his wealth, I mean, the amount of gold that he seemed to have was, was incredible. Uh, and and how, did quick, he, how did he amass that, Lawrence? Well, it's, it's impossible to know. I mean, we, we have stories and things like King Solomon's mines that come off of it. Um, uh, postulating theories, um, we, we know uh, that that certain um, certain kings of other regions um, were, were supplying Solomon with a lot of things, with ships, with chariots, with horses. Were they buying him off? Were they afraid uh, well, of him? Well, no. I mean, he he, he seemed it, it seemed to be in exchange for this sort of knowledge and and. and judgmental um, quality that he had. Um, and, and clearly what he was doing, I mean, and this is probably the, the, the real basis of it, that this land of Canaan, as it used to be, had sort of become consolidated under him. Uh, and it's a pretty large, you know, tract of land within that region. It sort of sat then with, with Phoenicia up on the coast and uh, the Jordan lands down below and whatever. And he was hanging and holding it all together. And this clearly was very, very valuable for the kings of the surrounding countries. Uh, and, and so money uh, and supplies were coming into him from Jordan, from Phoenicia, um, from, from the Yemen, various places. Even the Queen of Sheba oh, was gosh. said to have come and brought him a camel train with all sorts of goodies and spices and, again, gold. And... Um, the, the, the whole thing seems to center on gold. There was a heck of a lot of gold coming in. Uh, and the temple itself, when, when you read the, um, the, the the descriptions of it, and again, we don't know how real these are, uh, but you know, just a few hundred years after his time, it was being written that just about everything in the town place was covered in gold, you know, and even the shields on the walls were made of gold. 
Um, and, and so what we actually have here is a king who, whether in reality or, or whether simply um, in terms of boosting him historically, was very famous, um, very rich, and uh, judgmentally uh, quite a brilliant king, it seems. Uh, the big problem that he had in terms of biblical law, of course, was that, that what he did was to, uh, to upset the, the, the religious establishment right. quite a lot because he, he had loads of wives, apparently. They all belonged to tribes that had different gods and goddesses. So, so you know, he, he didn't really sort of hook into the one god thing um, that the Bible story is about. Uh, and that got him a bit of a bad name, but it also made him very fascinating. Uh, and, 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 you know, as rebels do in history, you know, the people sort of latch on to them. And from then on, you know, going down through history, he, he seems to have been looked upon as, as some sort of a model of kingship. And, you know, one can move into France in the Middle Ages, you know, right up to that time. And they're, they're still talking about uh, trying to make their kingship like that of King Solomon. Um, when we study um, documents of the Scientific Royal Society in Britain here, um, Isaac Newton wrote in, in the late 1600s that he felt that in terms of acquisition of knowledge, that we were all living in the shadow of Solomon. And that's why I called my book The Shadow of Solomon. It came from Isaac Newton. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, didn't they have some reference to King Solomon in some incredible treasure that it didn't go into, but it did speculate on the fact that there was something massive tucked away somewhere? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this comes up time after time, and it's, it's what the legends are based on. And, and maybe they're not legendary. Maybe there is a great treasure out there somewhere. Who, who knows? Um, I, I don't know how many people have ever looked for it or if they would know where, where to look for it. But quite frankly, you know, if he did have a treasure, it would seem to me that it probably wasn't very far from him. And, um, I mean... W he had the Temple of Jerusalem. He, he had all of the underground vaults there. Uh, now, in the 1870s, um, the engineers for, from Britain and, and the Palestine Exploration Fund um, dug down into those vaults. And they found all sorts of bits and pieces and interesting things. Um, but what they found quite fascinating was that they found quite a few Templar items, broken Templar swords, broken Templar crosses, things like that um, from the Middle Ages. So what they knew at that time was that, that these um, vaults had been excavated before, and history has always said, and it's been regarded as legendary by some, but, but one way or another, the stories have always been there about how the Templars... Um, Whilst they they were in Jerusalem, after, soon after they were founded, in fact, in, in the very early 1100s, they were um, digging away beneath the, the Temple Mount. And um, once they left Jerusalem in 1127 and were called back to Europe, uh, Bernard de Clairvaux, the, the abbot, who, the Cistercian abbot, who, who mm -hmm. was their patron and protector, um, had to get armies to, to, to ride with them through Europe. And, and in fact, what he said was that it was to make sure that the ecclesiastical bodies got nowhere near what they were carrying. Uh, so clearly, what they were bringing back was something pretty important, something very valuable um, that the Pope and, and the Church would have been after at the time. Could it have and, been the Ark of the Covenant? Well, yes, it could have been. I mean, it could have been all sorts of things. And, and, and in fact, the Ark does come up once or twice in Templar history once they're back in France, um, certainly in relation to Chartres Cathedral. What happened? Let's go back to Solomon for a moment. What happened to him? He died. I mean, did he get wiped out by someone else? Did he no, get he died. You know, he, he lived a long time and... Um, he reigned for 40 years, the Bible tells us, but on the other hand, it tells us that just about everybody reigned for 40 years. It was the standard. Um, it also rained. 
for 40 well, days. Well, I mean, it wasn't really let the rain. It, it was actually the, 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 the generational standard. Uh, 40 years was reckoned to be the, the generational the term, standard right? between a father and his son. I mean, I think yeah. the age now is about 30 for generational standards. But it was 40 years then for kingly dynasties. Uh, and so it was always reckoned that the son would be born when the father was 40. And whether the father was still reigning or not, that's when the son would effectively become king. So everybody seemed to reign for 40 years. Um, but no, he, he died in the end. I mean, it was there was no big deal about it. It was nothing special, and he didn't seem to get very involved in battles or anything of that sort. Um, he just liked his women and his fineries and his luxuries, and ruled his kingdom with, with an iron fist. It would seem, but um, was seemingly liked by the majority. Don't you think if he had this treasure, it would have been pillaged by that time after yeah, he died? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot would have been. Um, it's a very strange history, that place. You know, I mean, you, you, you've got King Solomon's temple. Then in later times, you, you, you've got various people assaulting it. The temple gets destroyed um, by um, Nebuchadnezzar in about 586, that sort of period, B.C. Total destruction then. Um, it gets rebuilt again some years later. Syrians then attack it, and, and, and other people attack it, the Assyrians from Mesopotamia. Uh, eventually along comes King Herod, and he enlarges it considerably, so we have a sort of a third temple. And ultimately, you know, that disappears and get, gets destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Uh, and, and so what we have is a, is a sequence of buildings and collapses and rebuildings and extensions on the same place. And then in the end, it... it, it, it gets taken over by Islam, and the, the mosque is built on the site, uh, as it's still there, there now, El Aqsa Mosque. And uh, so it becomes a holy site of, of Islam as well as Christianity, as well as Judaism, and everybody claims it, everybody wants it. Um, in terms of its uh, treasure... Or, or what might have been stored beneath it. Again, we've got very little other than the Bible to go to on, on in, in the early times, but there's nothing in there about Nebuchadnezzar when he raided it, or his armies raided the temple in 586 B.C. about them. I mean, it, it claims that he carried off... Uh, the pillars and brazen lavers and all sorts of various bits and pieces, but it doesn't mention the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so yet, I, I would have thought that Nebuchadnezzar may have brought back this treasure to Iraq, modern-day yeah. Iraq, and it's hidden away there somewhere. Well, yes. It's just that, you know, it, it's not listed. What What's listed are a lot of very exciting things, but nothing that, that would relate to it being an enormous treasure. Right. Uh, you, know, I, you know, valuable nonetheless, but... Um, could it have been and blown again, up? in Roman times, you know, that, that there's uh, stories of, uh, of the looting that went on then, and again, a, a listing of things that were taken, even in the Roman archives. Uh, but again, nothing of any any enormous value. I mean, the, the sort of treasure one would expect to pick up from any palace anywhere, uh, or any temple anywhere, but, but nothing, nothing tremendous. Uh, so if Solomon had treasure that was buried somewhere, then either it wasn't buried there, or those that were looting at the time in those early days didn't get it. And then, of course, we have the, the, the sort of unknown factor of the Templars in the 1200s, that knowing that they brought back some, something enormous, something that was described as, as so valuable that, that it basically overturned the financial structure of the whole of Europe. Uh, so, so clearly they came back with a heck of a lot. I mean, yeah, they had, they had something. Yeah, yeah. Some believe that uh, some of Solomon's treasure might be in North America, hidden away. Yes, I mean, they do, and I, I, I can't possibly dispute that. I mean, who, who, who knows? Uh, the thing is that, that if that is the case, then there, the reason that, that, that people must know that or, or think that they know that is because they must have some knowledge of, of something that I've never read about when it was found and taken there. I mean, I, I simply don't know that. Um, All right, stay with us, Sir Lawrence. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Templars, Freemasonry, secret societies, and much more. Hey, pick up the After Dark newsletter. You get 13 issues for the price of 12 when you call one 
727-5505 or go online at coasttocoastam.com. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norty with Lawrence Gardner as we talk about the Shadow of Solomon, his uh, latest work that at least has come to this part of the world. The Templars, the Freemasons, were they set up because of Solomon's treasure or were they set up for other reasons, Lawrence? The, I suppose we have to begin with the Templars because they were much earlier than Freemasons. Mm-hmm. Um, what actually happened was that, that, that when, when the Crusaders were, were, were out in Jerusalem at the end of the 1000s uh, from about 1096, um, they were being led by a, 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 a guy called Godfrey de Bouillon, who established out there quite quickly um, various knightly orders, uh, one of them being the Order of the Temple of Jerusalem. And, and so the Temple beginnings uh, were, were quite early, around about 1100, that, that sort of time. Uh, they, they were set up within Jerusalem. Um, they grew quite quickly in number, but to start with, there probably weren't too many. And, and history tells us that they were established um, for, for no other purpose but to um, protect the roads for the pilgrims and that sort of sure. thing. They, they, they were soldiers at the beginning, right? Oh, well, they were they were nobility yeah. um, rather than so. I mean, they became soldiers, and I, I guess the, you know, the nobility I mean, was... But were, they were armed. They were fighting men, but they were armed. They were a military unit. Yes. Uh, but, but essentially what happened was that they, they, were, they were formed really more, more as a, a sort of ambassadorial team to, to begin. Um, a, a lot of very strange things were going on out there at the time, and, you know, people were being slaughtered in the streets, and nobody really knew who was who. You know, there were Jews there, there were Christians there, there were Muslims there, and, and they, they'd all been living, you know, pretty well together until a whole load of different sort of Muslims came in from Turkey uh, and took over the whole uh, the, the, the whole thing, and basically the Crusades were, 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 were out there to... Um, Make sure that that Jerusalem was taken back from these Turks, um, but but not necessarily from the Muslims, because the Muslims that have been living there before had been doing so quite peacefully, and 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 there was no problem. But what happened, of course, was that the Crusaders didn't have a clue who was who. Uh, they didn't know one Muslim from another. They didn't right. know who, who who was from that country. Who, you know, who, who was from Iraq, who was from Egypt, who was from Turkey. And so it, it, it kind of went wrong, and there was a lot of unnecessary slaughter going on or whatever. And, uh, and so the Templars, in the first instance, appeared to be a sort of diplomatic unit that, that were, 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 were trying to, to, to be diplomats in this environment, negotiating between the various leaders and this sort of thing. However, it, it didn't take very long. Um, after the death of, of Godfrey de Bouillon and King Baldwin, took the throne in in Jerusalem, when the Templars were actually set up in, uh, effectively, what what had been the headquarters uh, uh, of of the king at that time. And he moved off into the place which is uh, the the, the, the Rock of David now, with the big dome on it. So he left them in this place which was was effectively the palace. Yeah, how many do you think were there? A hundred? A thousand? It, no, it, do we know? It, it's not. It's not possible to say. I mean, I think we're talking about a couple of dozen, something like that. That's probably. all. Okay. I, I think so at that stage. I mean, it, it, there's no indication that there were loads and loads of them because when they came back to Europe, they had to have an army to protect them. So they clearly weren't that big uh, 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 as a military number. Um, but what happened was that they were left there in this palace, which. Um, was the, on the site of, of, of the old temple. And we're looking at that date, round about 1118. And they then spent from that date until 1127, seemingly doing nothing much else but digging. Their whole job seemed to be to stay there in this place where they were quartered and just to keep digging and excavating. And they were doing all the work, or they had helpers? Well, clearly they had helpers and people that came in, but, I mean, they were doing the work. I mean, right. that, that's the way it reads. And, and where did the Templars come from? I mean, were they Arabs? Were they, were they no, Jews? No, they, they were Flemish were they? and French, mainly. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
mainly French, mainly, and, and some, um, some from Flanders in there as well. But they, they were basically nobility, um, people related to one another by different birth strains, um, some church-based people. I mean, in those times, the, the key abbots, they, they were linked up entirely to the Cistercian order. They must have thought that they got the short end of the stick if they got pushed out to that the area of the world instead of staying in France or, or England. Or, or Well, I mean, the whole the, the whole crusade was, was based on the knights and the nobility going out to, to lead these crusades. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, when true. that lot had finished, out, out, out when King Richard of England had started his crusade later on, you know, everybody wanted to be in on it. Everybody wanted to win Jerusalem for the Christians by then. But to start with, the first crusade wasn't about winning it for the Christians. It was simply about getting these invaders out of a, of a place that had been pretty peaceful. Right, then. right, okay. Um, but, but anyway, the, the, this digging all sort of goes on for this period of time. And then the next bit of the story that we get is that in 1127, back they come to Europe. Um, they're instructed by the papal legate to convene a council um, in, in January. It was of the following year of, uh, of, of um, 1128. Famous council when, in fact, they were then formally constituted into a knightly order, which prior to that had only been a sort of temporary arrangement. Um, but the, the story gets ever stranger because at that stage of their history, they were suddenly enormously powerful. They started loaning money to just about every crown in Europe. The Pope um, decreed that they actually had an autonomous status that they effectively, as a unit, uh, as an order, had state status. So they were their own state. They were responsible to nobody, to no king. Um, their only superior was the Pope, and that was okay for them at the time because the Pope was a Cistercian, and they, they were linked to the Cistercian uh, monastic order. They were military monks, effectively. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and well the legend grew from there. You know, they, they became probably the most powerful institution that the world has ever seen. And very wealthy. Enormously wealthy, yeah. Where did they get their money? Well, it, it, it began, it seems, with what they brought back. They found something. Oh, they found tons. I mean, what they brought back from the temple was uh, said, I mean, the words that were used at the time, the writings that we get, Simply state, it was an incredible storehouse. Words of that sort. That could have been Solomon's treasure. Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's correct. That's the way it's portrayed as being, and we presume that it probably was. Whether it was all of it or some of it, we don't know. Uh, we haven't a clue. But what they came back with was an enormous volume of wealth. And from then on, what happened was that just about everybody who was anybody wanted to join the order. And the rules for joining the order were, I mean, to start with, you, ha you had to be of some sort of noble birth. Right, okay. uh, I think it, it, it got a bit um, slacker later on. But to start with, and to join the order, what you had to do was to give up all your property and land and estate to the order. Okay. So you had to give away everything to belong to it. Sounds like a cult. Well, yeah, but what happened was that, that being part of it meant that you became enormously influential, very powerful, and were clearly on a, a darn good salary or whatever they did. I mean, did the, 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 Lawrence, did they have the old musketeer line, too, all for one, one for all? Did they band together? Were they close? Did they take care of each other? I would have thought so, yeah. Um, yeah, I would have thought they would have to, actually, um, because they, they had plenty of enemies as well as friends. I mean, you know, the, the, once you get into a situation like they were in, I mean, there was hardly a throne in Europe or the Levant that, that didn't owe them money. And so they were actually more powerful than the kings after a while. They, they, they became, they moved from being ambassadors to, to also basically becoming prime ministers and presidents. presidents were they, I mean. would they become almost like the bankers of the world? They did. All oh, right. yes. I mean, they invented the checkbook system and all, all of this sort of thing came out of those Templar times in the Middle Ages. Amazing. The checkbook in, the, in those days? Yeah, promissory notes. Uh -huh. um, yeah, they, they, were, they brought in a system of, of writing notes to promise, 
the other person money and, and they would guarantee to back it just as banks do now, same, exactly the same. Uh, they introduced that. They introduced the sort of early insurance policy. I mean, the, the, this idea of insuring things and whatever, they began that then. Um, just about everything that, that, that happened in the banking world, they invented at that time. However, what they said was that they didn't invent it. It was what had actually been going on in Jerusalem and the land around when they got there. They, they just, just they learned from that. They learned from it and improved the system, yeah. Well, then somewhere along the line, they crossed somebody or they got too wealthy because somebody wanted to disband them, right? Oh, yes. Um, and kill them and crush them. They, they, they became enormously powerful. Uh, uh, and the, the, the king who was most concerned about this was Philip IV of France. And, um, well, he was heavily in debt to them, wasn't he? Well, he was enormously in debt to them, but so were others. Um, the, the thing was that, that to be able to move against the Templars, you had to have the Pope on your side. And Philip didn't have the Pope on his side. Um, the Pope at the time was mysteriously murdered. And um, another Pope was brought in who was actually a friend of King Philip's. Uh, isn't that convenient? That's very convenient, yeah. Uh, and so it seems that between them, and this is how the story goes, although it's actually changed in recent times, this story, but the story was that from that moment, the Pope and King Philip set up this this persecution of the Templars. And we're, we're now in 1306, moving into 1307. And in that year of 1307, the, the big day came, and all the Templars were rounded up and were fleeing all over the place, and, and they ended up being tortured and oh burnt and, and whatever. But the interesting thing recently is that it, 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 just a few years ago, and in fact the Vatican have published the actual facsimile documents within the last few weeks, um, just a few years ago, a document was discovered in the Vatican secret archive that nobody knew about before, and it was actually this particular pope, Pope Clement V, it was actually a letter from him to King Philip telling him that he wanted nothing to do with any of it and that Philip was to leave the Templars alone. A little late, though. Well, no, it wasn't. I mean, it, 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 it's, we're late discovering it. But what happened was that Philip ended up taking absolutely no notice of the pope at all. So although he'd put this guy in position as his ally, and history has always recorded that the Pope led this persecution of the Templars, what we're learning now is that he didn't. And even when they were, were, were in captivity, he, 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 he was explaining that they shouldn't be tortured and whatever, and they, of course they were being tortured. So, so, so King Philip seems to be a, 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 not a particularly nice guy, and it all led, in the end, to the execution of Jacques de Molay, which was effectively the end of the Templars, although it wasn't. It was simply the end of the Templars in France. I mean, very many of them died, uh, and very, very many of them just disappeared, and we never heard of them again. But, but 18 of their galleys, um, loaded with all sorts of goodness knows what, sailed from La Rochelle on, on the French coast, and some went to Portugal, and some went, just, went to Scotland. So we, we know those two things, uh, and we know what happened to them in, in Portugal and in Scotland. And... Um, in fact, interestingly, uh, out of all of the, the supposed Templar orders worldwide that there are, there are only three in the whole of the world that are recognized by statute even today, and they are in Portugal and Scotland. Well, that, it's a great story to build up to, of course, Freemasonry, as we're going to get into that pretty soon. But with these Templars, uh, in their, you know, they're disbanded, uh, yet you say, though, that some of them were still around in other regions of the, of the world. At that time, yes. What about their wealth? Well, the wealth supposedly dissipated. When well, no, uh, you know, it, it, it's really interesting, and this is where the story of the Ark of the Covenant comes in. Um, the their center was the chapter house in, of the treasury in Paris, and the majority of their wealth. Because they need, if they were a bank, you know, they needed a place to keep their wealth. Um, the majority of their wealth was kept in the chapter house of the treasury in Paris. 
Now, what happened was that when, when the Templars were being rounded up, um, the, the king's troops and, uh, and various people were, were scouring France to find the Templar treasure. And, um, that, I mean, there are all sorts of stories about where they tried and, and what they tried and whatever, but they never really came up with anything. So <laughs> King Philip gained, gained actually nothing at all at the end of it. Um, but the, the chapter house treasure was what was supposedly placed on these 18 galleys, which were taken to Scotland and taken to Portugal. Now, interestingly, there is a painting at the um, Palace of Fontainebleau in France, uh, which shows um, a Templar gathering at the Paris Chapter House during that period, and there... At the front of their meeting hall is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, when did it apparently go to Ethiopia, if it did? It didn't. You don't think it went there? No, okay. there, there's, there's no history. There, there's no history about that that didn't appear until about the 1800s. Um, it, 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 it's very legendary, um, the, the Ethiopian story. Um, in, in fact, the, the bit of it that, that even begins as being nonsensical is the, is the fact that it starts off with a son of King Solomon secretly stealing the Ark of the Covenant and, and running away with it to Ethiopia. Now, from the Bible, which again is the only text that we actually have that anything could come from during that period about this, um, moves not only through King Solomon's reign, but through the reign of king after king after king after king after him, and in all of those reigns, it keeps telling us that the Ark of the Covenant was still at the Temple of Jerusalem. This is fascinating. And um, so we know that it wasn't taken. And, and in fact, there is a particular time where one of the kings actually has it moved um, to a place in Shiloh to, to have it safeguarded for a while. And then it's brought back to the temple in the time of Jeremiah, the, the high priest. And at that time, we're, we're pretty much around the era of Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. So, you know, we know from the Bible that it was there. So these legends that came up in later times um, about it being moved secretly and stolen overnight and taken away by this son are, are, are nonsensical. Um, what's, the, I, what's the last report we have, biblically or otherwise, about where the Ark of the Covenant might be? The, what's the very last, I, I guess... The, the very last... Writing. Writing about it is a carving on a pillar of Chartres Cathedral, uh, which was built by the Templars and their guilds of Masons um, in the 1200s. And this is on the gateway um, of the initiates uh, to the... Um, Cathedral. It actually shows a picture of the ark being transported by knights, and it makes the point. This is this is where you go into the cathedral, and and it makes the point that this is the place where the ark was yielded. Now there's the enigma. Yielded. What does that mean? The ark was yielded at that place. Um, to yield means to give up means all sorts of things. Uh, somehow or other, it would seem from that that the Ark was there, and then it wasn't there. And that's the last we hear of it. I mean, there's nothing after that which, which tells us where it went or what happened to it. Um, but the indications are from other literature that the Ark was in France. We know from the painting it was very likely there. And it seems to have been connected with Chartres Cathedral, and then it's yielded. See, I think I'm wondering, Lawrence, if it's in the home of some wealthy person somewhere. What do you think? Who knows? I mean, the thing about the Ark is that, that it's it's one hell of a contraption. I, I when I was writing about it, Let, I, let's I, let's talk about that when we come back at the top. I, I want you to describe what you think it now is or how it worked. Some people say if you touched it, you died, you got electrocuted. We'll be back in a moment with Lawrence Gardner on Coast to Coast AM. 